everyone, and welcome to Liz Collin Reports, where we talk truth. It's why I'm excited to get to the story this week and this week's guest, former EcoHealth Vice President, whistleblower, and Army veteran, Dr. Andrew Huff. His book, The Truth About Wuhan, How I Uncovered the Biggest Lie in History, will be available next month. Dr. Huff, you said it's okay if I call you Andrew, um, but I do want to start by saying this is now the third time we've tried to connect with you uh, for doing this interview. I think it gave us some good insight about what your life has been like since coming forward, but explain that. You're now officially a whistleblower. Uh, what, what has life been like for you? Well, it's been interesting. Since I came forward as a whistleblower in the fall of 2020, uh, 2021, I've been repeatedly hacked. Um, I actually, at one point, I was under constant surveillance. I was being tailed places. A lot of craziness, which really seems over the top, just for plainly speaking the truth of what I observed while I work, worked at EcoHealth Alliance. Facts that I put together okay. uh, with all the information that's really come out over the past two years, I guess, made me a target for U.S. government surveillance. So we know we're, we're actually just uh, a glitch here now, but I know you've sent me a lot of photos with different uh, people hacking your system and such um, that we're going to share uh, in, in this as well. But I, I want to back up a little bit because you do have ties to Minnesota, which we thought it was especially important to, to hear your story on the podcast today. But you served in the Minnesota National Guard. Also, I know you're a University of Minnesota graduate. Um, but yeah, just just take us back uh, to your ties to this state. Yeah, sure. So I grew up in uh, Anoka County, mostly in uh, the city of Anoka and the city of Blaine. Uh, I have a lot of family members all over the, the north and the south metro, and then a lot of family members in western Wisconsin. So a lot of strong ties to the, the Twin Cities area, a lot of family and friends there. Um, like like you, you said, I went to the University of Minnesota for all my degrees, uh, so I spent quite, spent quite a bit of time there. And then I also served in the Minnesota Army National Guard. So you've put uh, all of this out there. You're coming forward more and more as uh, each day uh, progresses. But this bombshell report, uh, here it is, that you put on, on Twitter just recently. Uh, but the report about the real origin of SARS-CoV-2, uh, this letter sent to the U.S. Senate and Congress and the law firm representing you, Rens Law LLC, clearly states, and I'll just uh, quote so folks can follow along, that SARS-CoV-2 was indeed created in a lab in Wuhan, China, by EcoHealth Alliance and with funding from Anthony Fauci's NIH. I know the case has now been a case has now been filed in New York uh, by Ren's Law as well that you're involved with. But let's uh, start with just, just coming forward with your story and your ties uh, to EcoHealth Alliance. Yeah, so I have a really interesting background. So after I came in the military, I thought I was going to be a psychologist. Uh, my undergraduate degree was actually in psychology. I started managing mental health outpatient care facilities for the Department of Veterans Affairs. And I actually decided that I hated counseling. Um, I had a terrible bedside manner. And actually, I was more into the research than anything. So I went on to get a master's degree in security technologies at the University of Minnesota with a, with a minor in geographic information systems. So that's like Google Maps and the backend component of that, how you code that information or do analyses, a real, really sophisticated kind of spatial mapping and analysis techniques. Um, so with that knowledge, I was trying to leverage my national security background to get a job in either corporate security or back in national security. And when I completed my thesis, uh, my graduate, uh, my master's thesis committee heavily persuaded me to go speak with Dr. Uh, Jeff Bender at the uh, College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Minnesota to pursue a PhD. And I was really confused. I, I really wasn't interested in getting a PhD at the time. Uh, because of my military experience and my education, I really wanted to, just to get back to work. I had felt that I felt like that I spent too much time in school. Well, they gave me an offer I couldn't refuse. So they basically paid me a, a very healthy salary, plus I received a full scholarship, uh, plus I had my veterans benefits to go on and get this PhD, and they actually handed me a data set. And I was working in a research center at the University of Minnesota, which used to be called uh, the National Center for Food Protection and Defense, which is the Department of Homeland Security Center of Excellence. Uh, your audience might be wondering, you know, what is all that, that sort of jargon? Well, really, it's a research center funded by the U.S. government for national security. So a lot of times the, the U.S. government funds these, these center of excellences so that they can address specific national security problems. So there's a lot of scientists working at universities working on these national security issues. They handed me a data set, which really shaved a probably a year to two years off my PhD completion time because a heavy or a large portion of your time or a significant amount of your time is typically spent uh, collecting these data. So if you don't have to collect data and someone's handing it to you, it really speeds up the process. 
Well, I was actually being groomed to be um, a leader in, in government or national security. I was spending probably a week on average in Washington, D.C., as a PhD student meeting with different stakeholders in national security, primarily in, in food and agriculture, because a lot of my, my research focused on bioterrorism or agroterrorism. But it really expanded across all the different what they call critical sectors. Well, I, I did really well, I was successful, and I sort of had the my ability to pick which government agency I wanted to go work for or what entity tied to the national security complex. So I, I met some other scientists from Sandia National Laboratories, and I was really excited about the work they do. Um, for your audience, Sandia National Laboratories is primarily a, the laboratory where they engineer and design uh, nuclear weapons. So this is a top secret uh, facility. It's one of the, the premier facilities, I guess, for national security research in the country. And it's a prestigious honor to work there as a scientist if you want to work in one of these kind of facilities. Well, at first, I really enjoyed working there. Uh, I got to see things and and uh, be, had access to information and in the national security world that you can only have in those places, and I can't talk about it. But it was enlightening, and it, it worked. It opened up a lot of um, my creativity to how I could address these kind of problems. Well, at the lab, I, my research expanded, so I was no longer just specializing in bioterrorism or biowarfare. It my research expanded back into more of the larger public health domain. So I was working on pandemic preparedness, uh, pa pandemic response, uh, still continuing on bioterrorism and biowarfare, but it was really expanding. Well, as I worked there, a couple different things happened. So sequestration happens and they start to cut funding for my work. Another thing that happens is that my work is increasingly classified. And through that process, um, I sort of see the writing on the wall. I'm like, if I keep working in this national laboratory environment, all my work will be classified and I will no longer be able to talk about it. And as a scientist or an academic, if you can't talk about the work that you're doing, then you'll end up trapped in that environment for eternity. It's sort of a, it can be a death sentence. So I started looking for other, other employment or other work elsewhere. And within a week of searching, I found a, a job opening at a place called EcoHealth Alliance. And it was for a senior scientist in data technology. Really, it was doing a lot of advanced computational modeling uh, and disease sur surveillance work, which was my exact expertise. So I, I was developing these advanced complex simulations that could predict pandemics, or you could use these models to figure out how to uh, best respond to uh, different, different types of scenarios. A pandemic could be one, a bioterror event could be another. Well, I applied some of the application, and within a few weeks, I was interviewing uh, in person at Equal Health Alliance. I think I did really well at the interview, and I was hired. And this was this is back in 2014. So you moved from New Mexico to New York, uh, and you worked there uh, again beginning in, in 2014. Um, but just just explain that again, Eco Health Alliance, its importance, um, yeah, to to the COVID uh, story, and also you're working basically right alongside with uh, Peter Daszak, someone um, we all know well now. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Peter Daszak was my, my direct supervisor, my boss when I was hired as a senior scientist. Eco Health Alliance, at least when I was hired there, had the mission of, uh, through con the mission statement was something to this effect, by investing in cons conservation, we, prevent, we can prevent emerging infectious diseases from becoming a reality. Meaning, if you preserve or protect the land or the environment, then this exposure risk or this, uh, this potential for these diseases to emerge and spread uh, either regionally, locally, or globally is reduced. And there is a lot of face validity in that statement. So anytime you reduce the exposure risk between animal, anim animals and humans, uh, you, you really just mitigate the risks. And you can do that a lot of different ways. So through typical conservation techniques, uh, the old school definition of conservation. So if you buy land and you protect that land, then you start sort of keep people out of it. Then they're not going to come into contact with the diseases in nature where they could be ex where these people could be exposed. So real cool idea, cool cool premise. And it's my job when I'm hired to build these advanced bio surveillance capabilities. But I'm actually doing it for the Department of Defense. And I knew that going into it, and I didn't really think t 
to there was, it, there was anything nefarious behind it. And a bunch of interesting things happened when I first started working there. So I'm asked to review the understanding the risk of bat coronavirus emerges proposal, which is the gain of function proposal, which everyone's been talking about when I'm first hired. And when I go back and I look in the metadata of that file, it's really interesting because it looks like someone edited it after it was submitted. And what that means is um, for your audience, so when you submit these proposals to uh, the National Institute of Health, NIAD, that's where, what Dr. Anthony Fauci is in charge of, there's typically a really strict proposal process of how you submit these things. Well, I didn't think anything of it. You know, I'm, I'm new to an organization. My, my boss and the other people I work with asked me to review a academic scientific proposal. That's totally normal. I mean, it happens in every every scientific organization or academic org- organization that you work in. I didn't really understand the bigger context of what was, was going on at the time. So in this proposal, it's clearly gain of function to me. And at the time, there were a, a number of shifts happening with U.S. policy related to gain of function work. Uh, it was in a state of flux. It was a very controversial area. I had always been against it myself. But just because you're against something doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. Right. So and explain that again. What is gain, gain of function for our, our viewers and our listeners? Yes. Yeah, so gain of function doesn't have a technical legal definition in, in science. It typically means enhancing the infectivity, the transmissibility, the pathogenicity or the virulence of the disease that you're working with. So simply, are you making the agent gain function? Are you making it more harmful? Are you making it um, more harmful to humans specifically? That's typically um, what we're concerned with when we say the term gain of function in some kind of regulatory or legal uh, context. And again, this is something you said, even in in college, uh, you saw the the warning signs about and not something you supported, but in your role at at EcoHealth, EcoHealth, that wasn't your your job. You again, know it's happening and you're going along with it. Yeah, absolutely. And so I flip forward to page 127, you go through this proposal. There's a lot of dry documents, which are basically just filling out government forms and paperwork when you go to submit one of these huge grant applications. It's a lot of minutia, a lot of really boring stuff. And anyone in my position, we filled out many of these applications and you usually do it with a couple of administrative people to help you get through it because it's so much, so many, so much dry government reporting work to do. Well, one of these dry government reporting forms is called uh, the select agent form. And on that select agent form, you're supposed to list the, precautions that you're taking when working with uh, gain of function or select agents, they're called. So select agents is another government definition. So there's a list, if your audience were to go look this up, there to Google search, select agents. Uh, different government agencies have different lists of these, but really they're the agents that we tend to be mo- most concerned about when manipulating. Well, coronaviruses are one of these select agents. And the other thing I, that you can take a look at, so in my book, I actually describe uh, what gain of function is in, in more detail. And there's a page called the specific aim, aims page, which is at the beginning of the proposal, not to throw your audience off, but a lot of this is really complex. They, they lay out why this is basically gain of function without saying the word words gain of function or Dr. Das does because he's the principal investigator mm-hmm. in this. You go to the fast forward to the, the 127, page 127 of this select agent form, and it's a complete whitewash of their work. And... So there's several lies by omission which take place in that form. Uh, there are also sort of direct lies about the type of work they're doing by not listing that they're doing the select agent gain of function work. And then the worst part is they defer the responsibility of what's called the biosecurity officer or institutional biosafety committee to a subcontractor. That subcontractor is the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And technically that's not allowed uh, by NIH NIH's own policy. So me being a, a good employee, I, I mentioned to my boss at the time, you know, do we have a biological safety officer? I, you know, no, we don't. That's what my boss says. He says, we'll take care of this. Being a good employee, you know, I just sort of went back and said, okay, well, my boss says, you know, Dr. Peter Dasick says that he has this taken care of and not to worry about it. And I say, okay, and I go back to work because, you know, why would I argue with my new boss? I'm just hired into this place. Um, and, and you're and you're hired and, and promoted pretty quickly, too, and then you're um, accessing uh, the, the company's finances. You're seeing these government contracts for yourself, um, money that is being f- uh, funneled directly uh, to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. 
Yeah, it, there are a number of, a number of interesting things sort of happen uh, while I'm while I'm employed at Eco Health Alliance, and it happens so quickly. So I'm promoted because I I bring in a lot of grant money. So I think there was like a total of six or seven million dollars, which I d- directly contributed to bringing in. My largest contract with what's called the Defense Threat Reduction Agencies, I think roughly about four point six million dollars. And it transforms the organization. So we're able to get new computers, new technology. Um, I'm able to bring on more staff. I'm able to bring on better staff. And that has a huge impact to many aspects of the organization because I'm bringing in graphic designers, uh, more senior programmers to work on these models and simulations and these products that I'm building for, for DITRA. And through that, I ended up getting promoted. Uh, that's probably the main reason why I'm promoted. So I'm, when I'm promoted up to vice president, I start to see everything else that's going on at the organization, which I didn't really fully understand when I was a senior scientist because I wasn't sitting in those meetings. It also gave me the ability to ask other questions about the organization, You know what was going on in different aspects of it. Well, one of the things I was most troubled by is almost immediately after being promoted to vice president, I asked in a, in a finance meeting, well, how much are we spending on conservation? Because this is our big mission. And, you know, I was pretty bummed to, to find out that we weren't spending any money on conservation. So here we are this, you know, we're going out telling you we're this big fancy conservation organization. We're spending all this money trying to help animals. And really, <laughs> there's no such conservation going work going on. It was sort of a stretch. They were using the mission to say, like, hey, we're doing the scientific research, which, which could benefit conservation. But that, in my opinion, that's, that was a bit of a stretch. And Andrew, I think uh, an important point to make, too, is you're um, seeing some concerns when it comes to biosafety and biosecurity. Um, talk about what happens uh, when you bring those concerns forward uh, to Dr. Dasik specifically. Well, so by this time, I'm fully aware that we don't have a biological safety officer. We don't have an institutional biosafety committee. These are key terms used in NIH language. Uh, every university that your, your audience is probably familiar with, if they're doing biologics research, has one of these things. So I used to be a, lot, be a biological safety officer at Michigan State Uni- University within the College of Veterinary Medicine. Um, I was a treasurer on, on, well, not the officer, I was a treasurer on the committee. So I was on the institutional committee. Um, make sure I'm not fabricating anything here. So I was a treasurer on the, the, ins- the institutional committee. We had a biological safety officer who worked at, at the university, and I worked closely with her. And you have all these different roles, and you have these checks in the system. Well, Eco Alliance didn't have any of these things. And they were actually, my boss always had a sort of a, a flippant attitude towards anything security related, whether it was uh, cybersecurity, uh, information security. Um, I actually stepped up and offered to, to take on these other responsibilities in my position because I felt that I was the most seasoned in terms of, of security, biosafety, and I, I wanted to take on those responsibilities. Well, every time I bring up one of these issues, my boss, Dr. Peter Dasik, states that, you know, we're not going to do that. We're not going to invest in that. And that could have probably impacted the bottom bottom line because it either takes my time or um, it actually takes other resources to mitigate these issues. The other thing that happens here related to biosafety is that I'm asked to be put on the PREDICT program after I'm promoted. And so PREDICT was a, an international program to go out and sample viruses globally, predominantly looking for coronaviruses uh, in the Middle East and, and in Asia. Those samples then were, were in turn used in the gain-of-function proposal uh, funded by NIH, this understanding the risk of bat coronavirus emergence proposal. So I know all these different things are going on. I get put onto this, this project and I become the, the country coordinator for Jordan and Sudan. And on my first trip to, to Jordan, I noticed that the laboratories that we're looking at at these universities do not meet what I call Western standards of biosafety or biosecurity. And I, I don't believe that EcoHealth Alliance ended up working with these specific laboratories. I think they actually worked with some better laboratories. But that gave me a sense of what, what the risks and the issues were with the program as a whole. So when you step back and you look from a management, management uh, perspective, uh, as at an executive, you're always concerned about uh, pr- protecting the enterprise and protecting the enterprise from these enterprise kind of risks. So how do you effectively manage what's going on in, in one of these la- laboratories when, it, when it's so far away? It, it's, it's really tricky. So if you had any other business, how would you understand what's going on on the other side of the globe 24-7? You really can't. 
And the types of information, the amount of information that we're getting back from these foreign laboratories, whether it was the Wuhan Institute of Virology or any of the other countries that we were working with, was grossly insufficient. We are basically relying on the foreign countries that we were working with and the foreign laboratories sort of on the honor system. And I saw that as a, as a significant risk to the organization. And I even brought up in a meeting, I'm like, aren't we concerned, even the slightest bit concerned, that the, mis- the risk management strategies that we have in place are not going to be effective, that something could go wrong? And I specifically mentioned the context of the, the relationship that we had with the Chinese laboratories that you know, I asked in an executive meeting, well, are we slightly concerned that the Chinese might do something nefarious with this with our with our intellectual property, not so much looking at it as they could be doing this nasty gain of function work to hurt us, but more that they could be ripping the organization off because this genetic material is actually worth a lot of money. It has a significant financial value to it. So when I anytime I brought up these concerns, uh, Dr. Dasik quickly quickly uh, uh, what's a good way of saying it? dismiss my concerns. And also gain of function research we know now was supposed to stop in, in 2014, but explain that how it was allowed uh, to go on. It seems like sort of this lies by omission um, that we've seen in some of these uh, documents because EcoHealth Alliance was not subject uh, to NIH review. So it, it's hard to know what specifically how EcoHealth Alliance gets, gets through this loophole or if the loophole is created for EcoHealth Alliance. So what, what I know to, to be facts is that I have the, the, promotion, the, the submission of the proposal uh, dated, okay? After that pr- proposal is submitted, it's edited by somebody else before it comes into to my possession before I edit, edit it. And during that time, a, a federal ban on gain-of-function work had went into place. So I don't know if they had a meeting with NIH to maybe negotiate what was in the content of that proposal or why that proposal was, was edited before I received it, before I was to review it. Because the funny thing is I was asked to review this proposal after it had already been submitted technically. So in, in context, that means there might have been some other negotiation or renegotiation of the contract taking place, which happens. Only a, a formal investigation by the U.S. government will get to the bottom of it, or maybe through uh, the, law, the lawsuit filed by Ren's Law uh, might get a discovery into this, and we'll find out what really happened there. But all the while, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, the chief medical advisor of the president, Dr. Anthony Fauci, still uh, de- defends this research. It's really, it's really strange that they're defending this research, and they actually refunded it. And so you, you have all the lies by omission originally happening on this select agent form. And they keep doubling down on this work. And in my opinion, it, it's rather, it's rather, it, it's a rather ineffective way to solve the problem that they're trying to solve. So this goes back to the, to the reasons why I'm against gain-of-function work. So gain-of-function work exists under the premise that in a laboratory, we can make these diseases or these infectious, infectious agents more harmful and help make them evolve faster to have all these uh, sort of negative traits, these harmful traits, with the premise that we will develop a medical countermeasure, a vaccine or a drug, to get ahead of the evolution of this, this disease. The problem with that is fundamentally that it's naive, naive of humans to think that we can evolve an agent or a disease in a laboratory the same way that it would evolve in nature. And if you look at SARS-CoV-2, the virus, it's underwent hundreds of thousands of years of genetic evolution in a matter of years from human manipulation. That's really troubling because here we are telling everyone that we're doing this gain-of-function work and we continue to fund this gain-of-function work with this idea that we're going to build these drugs or these, these vaccines or countermeasures, and here we are, and the demon gets let out of the cl- closet, uh, uh, the demon gets let out of the, the freezer, so, so to speak, and we can't ever treat it. And <laughs> it, it's, just, it's just ridiculous, and it's mind-blowing. So here we are spending all this money to make diseases that es- escape the lab, and then if we talk about the f- effectiveness of 
the mRNA platform in, in treating it, it's not a highly effective uh, way to, to treat, treat this. And day by day, there's more medical evidence coming out, more epidemiology, more research showing that there are a lot of negative side effects to the mRNA uh, COVID shots. So mm-hmm. you have to ask yourself at the end of the day, like what in the heck are we doing? You know, from a public health policy research standpoint, what are we doing here? None of it makes sense. And you seem to to have these concerns, uh, you know, year, years and years ago. But let's ra- let's wrap up um, your time at EcoHealth Alliance. I know you left in 2016, so all in all, you're there just just a couple of years. But but talk about uh, why you left. What forced you out the door in the end? Yeah, there, there's a number of different things that that forced me out. So as I be- as I become more aware of the Predict program that I'm involved with, I come to the realization that. The stated intentions of this program and the organization, none of it was adding up. So Peter Daszak and a number of other people that we worked with were running around saying that we're going to be able to predict and forecast the next pandemic before it happens. And then simultaneously, we're going to develop medical countermeasures to prevent that, that pandemic from happening. So those were two different conversations taking place. So he's telling one group of stakeholders that we're going to predict and forecast pandemics. The other group of stakeholders, he's telling, hey, we're going to build med- medical countermeasures to these pandemics that we that we think are coming. And none of it's really adding up to me. None of it really makes sense. Uh, Peter Dasik lies to me about something related to the, the everyday business dealings in, in my department, which makes me look bad. And, you know, there's one thing that, that I learned, never work for a supervisor or boss who, who lies to you. So I just make the decision to exit the orga- uh, organization. I start looking for employment in the fall of uh, actually maybe early winter, late fall of 2015. And it, the day that I found ex- the external employment to Equal Alliance was one of the happiest days of my life. And, and years passed then and you hear about uh, COVID-19. Um, and this is before the rest of us do, but it's really a fascinating story. Just to uh, explain how how you heard um, and what's going through your mind uh, when you hear about it spreading through China. Yes. So I become aware of uh, SARS-CoV-2 or the emergence of a, a upper respiratory condition uh, in mid-December of 2019. So to refresh your, your audience, they weren't even talking about COVID or mm-hmm the disease that would be later named as COVID until mid January of, of 2020. So I find out through uh, public health forums with people that are in the region, they say that there is a infectious disease outbreak occurring in Wuhan, China. So using my, my, my spatial analysis, my infectious disease detective tool. So that's what a lot of infectious disease epidemiologists are. We, we want to figure out where these things are coming from, how they're spreading. So one of the techniques to do this is you can go look at spatial data. There's a lot of satellite data available uh, for many parts of the world for different things. And one of the things that's the one of the spatial data sets or satellite data sets, which is phenomenal in China, is the air pollution data. So PM, particulate matter 2.5 and, and 10 are, are closely watched for air pollution. Well, what happens in an infectious disease outbreak event is that you have to, if it's severe, like these people are claiming, you have to get rid of the bodies. And in urban settings, typically that means crematoriums because you don't have the ground or the land to to do mass graves. So when I went and looked at these data and I analyzed what's called a plume dispersion model, I saw that these crematoriums were operating in overdrive. There's really no other explanation that could, 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 that that would support why these crematoriums were operating in overdrive. And, and since then, there's actually been other papers that were published in the past, I want to say two or three months, which show that the people did traffic analysis on vehicles and, and cell phones and, and found out that, yes, in fact, um, there, this disease had started spreading in China probably in September of 2019. So I, I become aware of it. In December 2019, after the wow. fact, we've been able to prove now looking at data and other, other things, other analyses have been done. It started spreading it in 2019, uh, September 2019. So immediately I started asking questions. I started, started calling up my other public health doctor friends. Uh, what's going on here? Why isn't anyone doing this? Some of these people work in the government. Some are, some are academics. And nobody really has a good answer. And then all of a sudden about two weeks later, uh, there's a epidemiology or uh, there's a, there's a, I should say it's a, 
a communications platform called ProMed, which is used by epidemiologists to communicate with each other about strange emerging infectious disease outbreaks. Basically, a lot of people like me hang out on this thing, and they use it to communicate about and gather intelligence about what's going on. Uh, by the time, you know, fast forward another couple of weeks, we're into mid-January, and everything the government or the U.S. government is saying doesn't make sense. Don't get masks. Well, including that, including that uh, this entire thing can be traced to a wet market in, in Wuhan. And, and you knew uh, from, from day one that just wasn't the case. Absolutely. So when the U.S. government starts communicating about where this came from uh, specifically, inferring that this was a wet market, uh, that really didn't make sense to me. So first of all, the term wet market has been really abused and manipulated in this case or this context of uh, this disease is emergence. And I think that was intentional. So we had two different, two different things in, in public health or in emerging infectious diseases. One's called the wet market. Another one's called the live animal market. And I think going back to what you were trying to, to get me to elicit is part of that spatial analysis when I did it, I went and looked at, at, went back to look at pictures of this wet market. And when I look at the pictures of this, this wet market, it looks like a nice, place where you'd buy uh, groceries in the Upper East Side of Manhattan. It's not dirty. It's not disgusting. And those are typically terms that we associate associate with something defined as a live animal market. So I've ate at live animal markets in places like Ethiopia, and it's not a pleasant experience. It's pretty uh, disgusting and pretty filthy. And I'm looking at the pictures of this wet market, which is looks sanitary. It looks like it's, it's well-maintained. I mean, it just was – I think they were playing on – you know, this is part of the cover up or the COVID cover up where they're playing on how naive Americans are about how, you know, wealthy Chinese people live. I mean, I, I think that that was really the goal here. And I think it was effective. Uh, and and hmm. you know, the whole the whole use of the term wet market is a little bit of a misnomer as well. It's actually when you go, you go look at the title of it, it's a seafood market. So there, there are relatively very few live animals sold at this market. So when you... Live animals, when they're being slaughtered and, and killed and they're under stress in an unsanitary environment, that's where you're really concerned for emerging infectious disease risk to happen. Now, when you put that in the context of what I saw and what I, what the data were available about the seafood market, it, none of it made sense because you could have some live animals, but unless they're really in these, these uh, terrible conditions, you don't have to be too, too concerned with it. Then you start fast forwarding what we're, what's being communi communicated to us basically through late winter and early spring in 2020 from the U.S. government and other f official sources. I'm like, what the heck's going on? In the back of my mind, I know that EcoHealth Alliance had a longstanding relationship with the Wuhan Institute of Virology and they were doing this gain of function work there. So I, I've come to the conclusion fairly early, fairly early that this is a, a naturally – man-made virus. And the funny thing is, a number of other scientists that were privy to information that I wasn't uh, privy to in January and February of uh, 2020, scientists working with Dr. Anthony Fauci, in emails, reverse their opinion. They, they come on and they say right away, this has all the characteristics of looking like a laboratory man-made agent. That's Dr. Kristen Anderson. And then a number of weeks later, he reverses his position. Well, what changed? He actually received, I think it's like $23 million or $24 million in additional funding from hmm. NIH uh, since he reversed his opinion. So basically this whole conspiracy cover-up begins of what the true nature and what the true origin of this is. And the reason why that happens is because it has the U.S. government fingerprints all over it, at least in terms of funding and mismanagement, so to speak. And I do want to acknowledge um, we're, we're having a, a bit of issue with your um, audio, but we're just going to keep uh, keep going because we're going to get this uh, interview done if it's the last thing we do. <laughs> well, and I, and I also uh, think it's good to just re remind people there, there's a reason uh, you're being messed with. And I think we're getting to, to, to that point um, at this point because you're working behind the scenes as you're you know privy to all of this information, Andrew. You're telling journalists um, how to how to find the truth. But but again, this lab leak, this whole it's all painted as some right wing conspiracy theory early on. Yeah, early on, it's definitely uh, well painted as a conspiracy theory, not even a right wing conspiracy theory. And then what's really strange is that that this is the first time I'd, I'd seen something, at least in my life, where a pandemic had been made political, whether it was man made or not. So I wasn't alive yet when the first incidents of this happened. But in 1977, um, 
a highly pathogenic strain of uh, influenza leaked from a Russian laboratory and caused a, a pandemic. And not many people know that. So that, that's, not very, that's not discussed very often. And in that context, everyone responded to it as it was just an outbreak of, of the, the flu. I think what's the main thing that's changed since then is that you fast forward 50 years or 40 years that through social media and how rapidly information spreads and then actually the improvements in science, we were able to get to the bottom of this much more quickly. It, it's really sad in my mind for public health that this has been so politicized and, and, and painted as a right wing conspiracy conspiracy mm. theory. Um, I, I probably have like a lot of Americans. I think I have a lot of moderate or center right kind of views. I'm not really extremist in any way. They want they want this to be. I should, and what I'm saying today, the people that are trying to cover this up, you know, the, the more that they try to to tag this with a fringe movement, I think the more that the truth has come out. So, NIH has already acknowledged that this was. Uh, this, that they funded gain of function work. So the the, inst, the overall institution already acknowledged and said we funded uh, gain of function work. Dr. Anthony Fauci uh, said that well, no, we didn't fund gain of work uh, function work because he's trying trying to protect himself. Well, I the reason why they've been messing with me and why I throw a big wrench in this plan is because I'm a first hand witness to what actually happened, and I'm highly credible. So they want to try to make me look crazy. They want to try to put a lot of stress on me. And I think now, at least as of last week, that ship has sailed because through Tom Renz and Renz Law, they filed what is the, one of the biggest lawsuits in history. It's over a billion dollars against Equal Health Alliance, Ralph Barrick or Dr. Ralph Barrick, who works at the University of North Carolina, and Dr. Ian Lipkin, who works at the University of Columbia. And they were people that were involved in the early stages of this um, gain-of-function work. And the plaintiff, the plaintiffs in the, the this case, um, are, uh, someone who died in a nursing home um, from COVID nineteen, someone who died in a hospital, and also a, a frontline worker um, who has uh, severe injuries. But I do uh, encourage people to actually read the lawsuit um, itself as well. It's uh, it's really eye opening. Yeah, and what, what's really strange about this too is that I speak with Tom on a fairly frequent basis. I, he calls me up with scientific questions or engineering questions, and he, we play stump the chump, and I try to answer those uh, for him for, for him quickly because he trusts me. You know, we we developed that relationship over time, and there's a number of other, I guess, conservatives or, or people who would be viewed as right wing who are now being targeted that are tied to Tom. And whether that's intentional or not, there's definitely some corruption happening within the U.S. government and maybe some of the state governments, definitely mine, because I was targeted by the Michigan State Police and the FBI and, and maybe the Defense Intelligence Agency. And I can prove all this. And I, I'm going to just uh, say, I'm just going to say, Andrew, I thought you did sound a little uh, crazy in the beginning, but now I believe it <laughs> after seeing it for, for ourselves, just trying to get this uh, interview uh, to, to actually happen. Yeah, everyone is like, this sounds like, you know, this sounds like not to sound so crazy, but they've actually, they've done the craziest stuff. So Tom and I did an interview, I want to say about three months ago, and they intercepted the Zoom call and someone injected rock music into the background blaring. So all the participants in the chat who were watching, we had a you know, few, few thousand people uh, watching it live, start chatting, where's all this rock music coming from? Where's all this rock music coming from? Well, none, neither one of us were playing rock music during this interview that we were doing they had injected it somehow in, into the software so they've spent a lot of money uh, in an attempt to silence me and to discredit me in an attempt to to bring in an, also probably in an attempt to prevent my book from coming out and they can't they can't stop any of this maybe they're trying to delay it past the election so this doesn't have an impact on the upcoming election I, i'm just hypothesi hypothesizing here i don't i don't know for sure but there's simply no way that that we can allow this type of research to go on it, with the, the terrible cost to society that this pandemic's had the, to the terrible assault on freedoms that it's having. I, I, I think you're just insane to think that the American people or anyone would be anyone would be insane to think that the American people are just going to stand for this. And they're not. And I think we've made incredible progress. I think I played a big part in getting the, the world to believe that this was a lab leak. Uh, myself and a, a number of other people who've been dedicated to that, proving that that uh, to be true. And that, and that's what people can't forget. Uh, six and a half million people uh, worldwide ha have have died from this. And I know it's a question you get a lot, and you write about it in your book as well. But what do you um, say to folks when they ask if this lab leak was an accident uh, or on purpose? 
Well, so in my book, I go through a number of the different types of techniques that you use in, in the national security world in and in public health to determine what likely happened. So there's a technique you, you use called a scenario analysis. So after you've looked at all the scientific uh, data that you have, all the hard facts, now you have to point to context. And from looking at all the information that's available and putting this in context, I don't believe that this was uh, an intentional event. And if so, it, it would have been the, the best intentional false flag operation. I mean, I'm sure there's some people who are through, I, I would view as being conspiracy people who, who would say that. But there's just, let me point out some key facts here. So after this starts leaking from the Wuhan Institute of Virology in September of 2019, the Chinese start scrambling to buy PPE and other containment equipment for this laboratory. And it looks like it's a situation of that they know that it's leaked, but they can't get ahead of it. They can't contain, can't contain this leak, and it's already spreading in the com community. So there could have been a series of leaks that, that actually take place in this laboratory as they're working on it, as they're advancing it between September and December of 2019. That's what I believe occurred. I think that's what the, the factual evidence supports. Uh, there's also a letter that was published by a Chinese corporation in, you know, China is a communist society, so this is like a Chinese government uh, corporation when you think about it, saying that they're really tired and they're saddened when it's translated by the ongoing series of events. At the World Military Games in Wuhan, uh, all the athletes report that the streets are empty and they're temperature checking everyone and everyone's wearing PPE. That's very strange, right? So if this hadn't been spreading already, um, that, that would have been some other case. It would have been a vibrant, active city. The other thing is that the athletes who uh, participate and attend the, the World Mil Mil Military Games in Wuhan, a number of them fall ill with a mis mystery illness, which has now later been identified as, as SARS-CoV-2. Plus, now we have the, the epidemiology, which points back to a release of September of, of 2019. Quite strangely, the Defense Advanced Research, Pro Research, Research Projects Agency, DARPA, attempts to recruit me Personally, in late September or early October of 2019, when I'm an executive living in California, I had made it clear to everyone mm -hmm. that I was trying to get out of this, this space and not work in it. And yet they're trying to, to hire me and recruit me. So you look at the circumstantial evidence, what I told you about my own personal experience, how they're trying to get me back into to work in the space in the class, classified environment, plus all the data that, that's in scientific evidence that exists now. It's pretty clear that this was an accident. It happened in September or maybe late August of 2019, and it came from a laboratory. I mean, that there's no evidence, not one bit of evidence, which suggests that this naturally emerged. None. But again, going back to this all could have been avoided, and that you think will come out in court. Oh, absolutely. This is, this is negligence at, 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 uh, at its worst. So when you think about what I reported to my boss and my supervisor while working at Equal Alliance. It's one thing just to tell a subordinate, yeah, we've got that covered, with the assumption that you actually have that covered or you're mitigating the risk or the concern. When another executive in a corporation tells you that there is a problem here and we need to do something about it, if someone who's more senior shoots that down but then doesn't do anything about it, that's negligence at best. At best. At worst, in this case, you could say it's murder or manslaughter or something to that effect. I'm not an attorney, but there's certainly a lot of liability on the shoulder of and negligence on the people that were involved in this research early on. In psychology, there's this term called social loafing, meaning that everyone sort of puts the responsibility or burden off on the others in the social group. There might have been some of that happening to some extent, but that doesn't excuse the behavior. And you mentioned this earlier, but it is kind of disturbing how quickly uh, people move on. But I want to end with that. What is your message now, two and a half years later, also so close to the midterm elections, uh, why this is so important to fully understand and to finally have the truth what hap about what happened here? Well, simply, the biggest, my biggest concern or my biggest worry is that if we do not identify specifically what happened, what went wrong in terms of the policy in terms of the, of the actual science at the laboratory, the management or the risk manage, management, which, which, happened, which happened between the U.S. government and the individual uh, 
contractors or awardees or subcontractors, they'll never they'll never really understand what happened. And if we don't understand what happened and we keep funding gain of function work, it's going to happen again. And if we keep funding gain of function work with this idea that we're going to develop vaccines or countermeasures to, uh, to get ahead, I think the scientific evidence and, and the reality, reality to all your audience is clear. It doesn't work. It's nonsense to be engaged in this and it's a waste of our money. So we need to stop funding this. We need to figure out what happens if this never happens again. Dr. Andrew Huff, we finally did the interview. Uh, Minnesota native and uh, obviously very important in in this entire conversation. Thank you so much for for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Again, Dr. Andrew Huff's book, The Truth About Wuhan, How I Uncovered the Biggest Lie in History, will be available next month. Pre-orders are available right now. And that'll do it for this episode of Liz Collin Reports. We'll see you next time.